Good afternoon, everyone. Today's uh, intervention is focused on decreasing health disparities. And um, we're going to focus on intervention strategies to improve health outcomes among racial and ethnic populations, as well as rural and low income populations. The speakers will share their expertise in developing policy and place-based preventative interventions to reduce health disparities and improve health equity. We have three fabulous speakers this afternoon. The first speaker is Dr. Deborah Fur Holden, Professor, Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at Michigan State University. Deborah will define health disparities and health equity and discuss how the built and social environment impact marginalized communities. Specifically, she will present results from her research focused on alcohol outlet density intervention aimed at reducing health disparities in urban African-American populations. Our second speaker is Dr. Kelly Comro. She is Professor Rawlings School of Public Health at Emory University. She will discuss natural experiments leveraging preventive preventive policy intervention that address family, economic security, and stability to improve maternal health behaviors and infant health outcomes. And in her talk, she will present research that's focused on the state level earn income tax credit laws on birth outcomes, as well as sharing those differences by race and ethnicity. And our final speaker, speaker is Dr. Allison Gustafson. She's the Associate Professor of the School of Human Environmental Sciences at the University of Kentucky. And she will focus on health disparities in rural communities. And she will later get, get into detail as relates to how neighborhood and place-based interventions can improve food security as well as diet in rural communities. Her presentation will focus on research that she's done and community-wide environmental on a community-wide environmental intervention on food insecurity and how that affects health outcomes. We are delighted to have these three speakers uh, this afternoon, and we'll start first with Dr. Uh, Fur Holden. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about um, behavioral health and policy-level interventions to promote health equity. Um, and decrease health disparities. I'm gonna first sort of give them some background and framing um, around the issue. So just some background definitions. Healthy People 2020 defined a health disparity as a particular type of difference that's closely linked with social, economic, and or environmental disadvantage. I'm gonna offer you another definition that comes from one of the sort of giants in the field of health disparities and health equity research, uh, Dr. Kamara Jones. And she gives a sort of better framing, I think, and says that health disparities are the differences in outcomes. And she links that to health equity. And she says, when health disparities are eliminated, that's when health equity will be achieved. So what's health equity? Well, as defined by Healthy People 2020, it's the attainment of the highest level of health for all people. The, the reason I, again, want to contrast Dr. Jones' definition is she doesn't focus on the attainment as if it's sort of like a destination, but really she talks about health equity as the assurance of the condition of optimal health for all people. And I'll loop all the way back around in the end to make that connection between the distinction between attainment versus assurance. Um, and then last thing I want to sort of lay as a foundation is a background definition for social determinants of health. So as defined by Healthy People 2020, social determinants of health are the conditions and the environment in which people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and age, and, and how those conditions affect a wide range of health and functioning and quality of life, life outcomes um, and risk. Um, and in these, um, these conditions and in these various environments and settings, like school and church and workplace and neighborhood, we call these things place. And we all know that um, place matters. And lastly, there are some more material attributes of place um, that aren't linked to the, you know, necessarily about the physical or built environment, but things like patterns of social engagement and a sense of security and well being and belonging um, are also affected by where people live. So I always say framework matters. 
Um, we have applied different models to solving health challenges and behavioral health challenges. This is an equality model. I love this example. It's very clear. You see there's this fence up, guys trying to get to the game. The tall guy doesn't even need a box because he's taller than the fence. But in an equality model, and we've done this before with resource allocation, everybody has the same size box. And you can see it's still not sufficient for the um, little guy there on the end. And then this is more of an equity fame framework where you can see here that people are being provided with what they need to be able to see the game. And let's just pretend that the game is your opportunity for optimal health. And then in a social determinants framework, again, going back, it's this notion of place and then the material attributes of place. You can see that the barriers for people having access to the game and being able to see the game, i.e. Uh, being able to have access to what's needed for optimal health, those things have been removed and now no boxes um, are needed. So the way I'll distinguish disparities versus inequities, disparities typically are differences, that's a synonym. They tend to be person-centered and they're downstream versus inequities, which are more linked to unfairness, um, systems, structures versus people. And they also tend to be upstream. Um, how to identify and track disparities. The first thing, and I'm gonna distinguish what I mean by upstream and downstream. And then I'm gonna give you a couple of examples from the field and out of my own research. So the first thing you do is disaggregate the data. And it's important that you not control and adjust the way disparity. And I know many of us were trained, we used to treat things that we now look at as the primary sort of emphasis of our work. We used to just control those things away. We treated race like it was a nuisance variable. We treated gender like it was a nuisance variable. Um, and we um, adjusted those things away. So it's important that we disaggregate the data so that we can first uncover disparities, that we not control or adjust them away, and that we come in with hypotheses but not agendas and really let the data speak for themselves. So upstream, this comes out of the um, geology literature, so the term upstream, as we've adapted it in public health and in other health sciences, um, or upriver, uh, refers to the direction towards the source of the river. So think of that as the systems, the structures, the core value of our society. And those are where the red arrows, red arrows are on this graphic that starts the flow of water. So systems, structures, values, those are the things that are upstream. And the term downstream or downriver describes the direction toward the mouth of a river in which the current flows. Think of that as where most of our work happens, the community context. Again, places where people live, work, play, worship, go to school, et cetera. And in a basic upstream thinking model, and these are from um, some of our uh, um, Canadian colleagues at the Health Equity Council, you know, you see somebody going in the river as they come down the river, we're trying to pull them out, but the resources needed once people get into that river are substantially greater as you move downstream. So our goal and a lot of our work and what some of my colleagues are gonna share about are things that we're doing sort of further upstream to stop people from going in the river in the first place. So I kind of am gonna give you a little bit of a formula around how I think people can be thinking about their work and moving from disparities to equity and equity-centered interventions. The first thing you have to do is identify what the downstream disparities are. And for better or worse, they typically are easier to identify. Again, you start to disaggregate your data and a story starts to unfold. The step after that is to then, when you identify disparities, to look further upstream for what we call the causes of the causes. So what's giving way, what's happening further up the river that's giving way to the disparities that we see downstream. And then lastly, you wanna develop and implement solutions and interventions that match the causes of the causes. And I'm gonna give you a couple of examples. So this is just a graphic from a colleague, again, another Canadian colleague at the National Collaborating Center for Determinants of Health. And just a quick point out a few things here. In this upstream model, what you see is you've got this idea of being socially inclusive. 
So that would be sort of like a system or a structure or a value. Sort of midstream, you see things like affordable housing and advocating for income supports. And then all the way downstream, you see the example of TB treatment. It costs us nothing to work on our core values around social exclusion. It, it costs us a little bit, it costs a little more um, to look at things like affordable housing, those require investments. By the time we get downstream, the costs, both human resources and, and human capital and physical resources also grow. So I also think there's great advantage to working upstream, again, stopping people from going in the river. So now I wanna give two quick examples out of my own research, and I'm gonna just give you the basics on how I followed those three steps myself. So, um, we first identified that we have massive community level disparities in violent crime. And this was work that I did in Baltimore. And I'll tell one on myself uh, when I get down to the last bullet. Can you turn his volume down a little bit? Thanks. Um, step two, we looked upstream for what are the causes of these community level disparities that we see in violent crime. And we identified two major inequities that we thought at least conceptually and theoretically were linked to violence. And there was some literature that supported that. The first thing is we identified inequity in the distribution of alcohol outlets. And the second thing, and it's linked to the first thing, is we identified major inequity in pro-social businesses in the high violence neighborhoods. And one might say, well, of course, no, you know, no one's going to want to put a daycare center in the middle of a high violence neighborhood. But the reality is families in need of daycare services live in high violence neighborhoods. Similarly, we know that people don't want to co-locate, for example, a hair salon next to a liquor store. They attract different clientele, et cetera. So a lot of these things are also correlated, but one looks at the problem downhill, downstream, one starts to move further um, upstream. So what we did then is we tried to match the level of intervention with what we saw further upstream was the level of the problem. And what we did is we implemented zoning changes to both reduce alcohol outlet density and also restrict and better regulate land use. And so that was about a seven year process. This is me telling one on myself. Um, as a researcher, I love it. You know, I'm a classically trained epidemiologist. It would be great if I could sit down, make sense of data, walk it you know, over to my state legislator and say, hey, look what I found. I think we've got some points of action. And then in a few months, we could start to implement things. It doesn't work like that. Trying to impact some of these um, larger systematic and structural factors does take time. But I will say it was six, seven years well invested. Um, that legislation has been put into place in some key communities. We've already seen early reductions in, um, in violence in Baltimore. The problem is we've also got a little bit of a displacement problem. So when some of these stores went away and some of the liquor stores and some pro-social businesses started to move in, some of what happened is we saw a shifting and some of those activities just moving over into other um, neighborhoods. So now we're fine tuning and we're tweaking that. And the fourth step, which I'll tell you about in this next, next example, is the ongoing evaluation of the work and impact. Oh, it's here too. Ongoing evaluation. We're doing ongoing evaluations of reductions in community violence and also looking for where we need to tweak that because we did see strides in some communities, but the goal wasn't to displace the problem. The goal was to mitigate the problem. And if anybody is interested in those, we have two published articles. One came out in 2019 and the PMC ID is available there. It's 6339605. And there's another one that just hit PubMed. You can just look for Holden et al. Um, 2020, and that is published in Health in Place. Another quick example is addressing inequity and opioid overdose death. So again, this sort of three-step process. First thing we did, identified black white disparities in opioid overdose death rates over time. And the unfortunately, it got sort of cut off here, but I can show, tell you that the bottom line represents blacks and the top represents whites or African-Americans and whites. And what you can see is somewhere around 2012, we get a rapid acceleration of the rate of opioid overdose death among African-Americans. And that is actually continuing to increase. And what happened among whites is you also got an acceleration, but it was not at the same rate. 
And then in 2016 and 2017, the rates slowed down a bit. And if you see those two purple dots from the top line, the rates actually dropped in opioid overdose death for, for whites from 2017 to 2018. And that is the first time that that has happened in over two decades. So it looks like we're doing some great work around starting to flatten that curve, but somehow it's only happening for whites. So we went step two and we started to look upstream for what were the causes of the causes of those of that disparity. And we identified two major things. And there are probably multiple other factors. A part of the reason we went here is because these are things that are also actionable and can be regulated with policy. The two big inequities that we identified is in access to medication assisted treatment, as well as access to recovery services. And that includes things like supportive housing and peer recovery coaching, um, et cetera. And so now what we're doing is advocating for equity and opioid prevention, both resource allocation, as well as the availability of services. And we're starting to move the needle um, on some of those things. So um, I'm gonna skip the gaps. I can't see what my timer is and how much time I have left. Um, but the, the, just a quick snapshot, we've got some gaps in the field. We, a lot of times as researchers and what you'll find in the literature and a lot of our initiatives, we talk about what, what health equity is, but we still mostly only, only intervene downstream. So we talk about inequities, but we really don't mount interventions and really push for the work that happens at the level upstream that's giving rise to what we see downstream. I think we also don't focus enough on how we got here. How did we get to become such an inequitable society, both broadly and relative to health? And we often don't talk about what we can do to achieve health equity. We really focus on these very discrete outcomes as if we've attained health equity versus what do we do systematically process-wise so that we can assure a more equitable framework um, and lived experience for people around health. And again, last piece is we often do not focus on the causes of the cause causes of health inequity, including all of the isms. And I think we're starting to really see the impact of that now with so much societal unrest. The last point that I wanna make is I wanna just draw attention to what we call the 17 year odyssey. I think you'll some, hear some great examples from my colleagues about how they've been able to overcome that, but we call it the research to practice gap or the leaky pipeline. It typically takes about 17 years for only 14% of research to be translated from a research priority into practice. And so it's 17 years for this very small percentage of research to actually be translated to something in practice. And the rest of it mostly sort of lives in the peer reviewed literature. So the disconnect I think is we should be increasing our emphasis. Once we identify strategies that work, we should be increasing our emphasis on dissemination and implementation research, science and practice. And as a quick example, I literally did a Google, a search in NIH reporter and there were 12,000 active project projects with the word trial in the keyword or the abstract search term. Similarly, there were less than a quarter, just about 2,500 of those who had that had the word implementation. So clearly we still as a scientific community have a value that's focused more on discovery or testing and less so on implementation of effective strategies. I'm gonna stop there and leave you with one thing that is one of my favorites. It's a really great video if you wanna be an ambassador and sort of introduce people to the world of understanding health equity and upstream and downstream and why it's so important that we stop people um, at very early in the process. And it's called The Cliff of Good Health and it is available on YouTube by Dr. Kamara Jones. And that is it. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Dr. Kelly Comro, and she will discuss her research. Thank you so much, Deborah. That was an excellent um, presentation. I look forward to our discussion, and um, you were perfect, perfectly timed. <laughs> so. 
<laughs> Anyways, I'm really happy to be here today. I'm so um, thankful for all of you um, for being interested in attending the virtual meeting. And I know I say this for all of us that we very much look forward um, to being together, hopefully next spring. Um, let's see. And I'm really excited to share with you um, some of the, the recent research that I've been doing um, related to family economic security policies. And really I'm viewing these um, as an extension of my preventive intervention research, right? So I'm looking at family economic sec security policies as a preventive intervention. And Deborah nicely really introduced and talked um, a bit about the Healthy People 2020. And I'm just showing the diagram um, really, and this really summarizes the, the research that we're presenting today, where I will be focusing on um, one of the five key areas, and that's economic stability. And really my guiding hypothesis for this line of research is that health disparities by race, race, ethnicity, and economic status will be reduced and health equity improved by increasing family economic security and stability. I think we're probably all very familiar with these um, horrible statistics, um, but this really also shows um, the interaction between race, ethnicity, uh, and economic status. So I'm, um, my whole line of research has been focused on child health. So this is, a, this is a figure from the recent report, a roadmap to reducing child poverty. Um, and if you, you know, this is poverty, deep poverty, and then poverty and near poverty. And you first see, I mean, all the rates are absolutely too high for children living in the richest country in the world. And, um, and of course you see these stark disparities um, by race and ethnicity. This is a um, conceptual framework for, for the body of research that I'm um, pursuing, looking at a series of family economic support policies um, and really viewing this, and this model was really is really based on the World Health Organization social um, conceptual framework for the social determinants of health, where they very prominently show the importance of policies and those those upstream um, structural issues that are really influencing um, the social conditions and the social hierarchy in in which we live. Um, which influences the environments, the living environments, um, the education environments, housing environments that one is exposed to um, with, with um, direct and indirect influences on health behaviors, and then of course, all of the, the health consequences. So in this line of research, I'm really taking a look at um, the, you know, testing the effects of different policies on health outcomes. So in, the, in this line of research, in this line of research, uh, looking at um, the effects of policies, um, we prevention scientists, unfortunately, are not in control of, of treatment implementation, right? So these are policymakers um, implementing or changing policies. But this provides a really important opportunity for us as scientists um, to evaluate the effects of these policies. And um, as I probably all of you are pretty familiar in the field of prevention science and public health, um, there has, has, has been a whole um, history of critically important research looking at the effects of alcohol control policies, tobacco control policies, injury, um, and so what I am doing here is taking the methods from these fields and applying them to the social determinants of health. So today I'm going to briefly um, summarize a set of three to four um, studies that we've conducted on one of the policies that we're interested in, and that's the earned income tax credit. This is just a summary of, of what this, of what the earned income tax credit is for those who may not be familiar. There is an earned income tax credit at the federal level, 
um, which began actually in the 1970s, but was really expanded with welfare reform in the early 1990s. The earned income tax credit was really designed to reduce the tax burden and also to supplement the income of low wage workers. Um, and states then began to also implement or um, pass legislation for um, a state level EITCs that supplement the federal credit. And states began doing this in, 19, in the late 18, 18, <laughs> late 18, 1980s, sorry. And then um, as I'll show you, there's been quite the diffusion across states and time. And this is, the, you know, this what is what provides a great opportunity for us to um, take a, a look at the effects, empirically evaluate the effects of these changes in policies. Um, so this um, is just showing you um, the diffusion or uh, of the state level EITC. So beginning um, right after the big changes in the federal EITCs um, in, in the early 1990s, there were only a few five states that had a state level EITC. The um, solid um, the so solid indicates that the EITC is refundable. And so refundable EITC is when your tax burden, um, you, you actually get a refund um, when the tax burden um, after, if, you know, if the tax credit is larger than your tax burden, so families get a supplement to their income. The ones that are just in the outline indicate that it's a non-refundable. So it's just the tax credit and no uh, refund. And so anyways, then you see the how many more states in 2020, um, 29 states in Washington, DC um, have implemented a state level EITC. The shades indicate um, the level of generosity. So the first study um, that I'm gonna review um, with you today is our main study where we looked at uh, over 20 years of changes uh, in, the, in the state EITCs and looking at um, birth outcomes and the effects of birth outcomes. And I, um, I just wanna um, introduce Sarah Markowitz who is um, uh, our colleague that we, we engaged in this research. Uh, she's an economist, so it was a great partnership between economists and um, us prevention scientists. So for this study, we, um, we were studying the effects of EITCs on birth outcomes um, over a 20 year period. And the, these maps just show the changes that occurred. Um, and we also, what we also did in this study was not only, it wasn't just a dichotomy if a state implemented the EITC, it was also looking at the level of generosity. So we came up with um, five categories. So all we have the states with no EITCs, and then we um, look at if, if the state EITC is refundable, so if the family actually gets a refund, and, um, and then the level, which was um, most state EITC, EITCs are based on the federal rate, so it's a percent of the federal. So we were looking at not only the existence, but also the refundability and also the generosity, the level. So in this first study, um, we took it was a multi-state, multi-year difference and difference approach. Um, we limit the sample. Uh, um, we're not looking ex um, in these analyses. We're looking at the state level policies and using the birth certificate data. So we're not um, actually measuring um, families that receive the EITC, but instead we re 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 restrict the sample to mothers with a high school education or less because over 60% of that population are eligible and receive um, EITC benefits. So in the modeling, we, um, we have three different infant health outcomes that we're looking at. 
And we're primarily, of course, interested in the effects of the changes in the policies of the EITC and the generosity. We also are um, able to control for some individual level covariates and some county level uh, factors that are related to um, our, health, our health outcomes. We also control for the state and time fixed effects. Um, this is the um, main outcome table, and I'm going to walk you through this. So all the numbers bolded are um, statistically significant um, and have similar patterns, especially for this, um, the birth. Um, so we have the three outcomes, birth weight in grams, and you'll see that um, the results show that there's really a, a dose response. If you look at... Um, the effects are the largest for the most um, generous state EITCs. And, a sim and you see the importance also of the refundability with these outcomes of both the birth weight in grams and also this outcome is looking at the low birth weight babies. And then our third outcome was looking at the gestation weeks. So let me just focus on this birth weight ones um, and you'll see that um, so the state level, the changes in the state level EITCs were uh, associated with reductions in the probability of low birth weight. And um, at the highest level that represents a reduction of 11%. We also looked at, um, we wanted to know if the effects um, were, because that's a summary, right, uh, of average effect of all births. And so here we look at birth weight quintiles to see if the effects were the same, even for the, the tiniest babies. And the results of this, and this is the change in birth weight in grams, and, and the different lines indicate the different levels of EITC. So just quickly, this top line is the most generous EITC, and you see that the effects, well, first of all, there's effects for, for any state that has an EITC, the babies are doing better than states that do not have the EITC, and um, the effects were largest for the smallest babies. We then um, took a look to see if the effects were, um, if they differed um, by uh, race and ethnicity because of the disparities that we see in birth outcomes with higher rates among um, black babies. And the results indicate that, so the, the, um, the black babies start out with a higher rate. So we actually did see larger percentage point improvements um, for the black babies compared to white babies. We didn't see any difference between Hispanic and non-Hispanic mothers. But when we look at um, a standardized effect size, it's actually similar across all the groups, which was equivalent for the most generous ones, 11 to 12% reductions. Our third study that I'm gonna just quickly go over was um, using the um, ARIMA modeling um, to take a look at the effects of the, the four changes in the uh, Washington DC's EITC because they made four um, changes to their EITC. They first implemented it in 2000 and then made these changes over an eight year period. And so we did a REMA modeling and the, this is the results from those. Um, where we see reductions each time the EITC, um, that there was a significant reduction each time there were changes and improvement, you know, increases in the EITC. And overall, um, from no EITC to a 40%, we see a 40% decrease in low birth weight births. So this um, line of research I feel is just really important and of course it has high policy relevance. So there are groups that then use the results of these studies uh, for policy briefs and to advocate for policy changes at the state level. I also just wanted to point out, I have this screenshot of this article published in pediatrics. There are also groups that are doing actually uh, randomized trials to test strategies to disseminate um, 
to disseminate the um, making sure that uh, that families are aware that if they're eligible for the EITC. And in this study, um, they were doing that in pediatric clinics. And then just showing you that we're also taking a look um, at different policies. We have papers on the effects of minimum wage, unemployment, um, which is highly relevant to what's happening right now. And um, also looking at the a pack, you know, the like the a combination of policies, so TANF, EITC, and minimum wage. Um, so please contact me if you um, would like copies of any of these papers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly. Um, very nice presentation from you and Deborah. Um, our next talk is Dr. Gustafson, and her talk is focused on health disparities and rural communities. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Alison Gustafson. I'm a professor at the University of Kentucky. And today I'll be talking about how food access is really connected to health equity in rural America. So I'll be defining um, health equity and health disparity for my talk specifically about rural is that health disparities, as we know, we learned about, they can be sex, race, ethnicity, income, and then geography. And so rural residents, of which 15% of the U.S. population, have systematically experienced greater economic and societal barriers, which overall we've seen impedes their trajectory for a healthier life. So from my angle, health equity is the equitable or fair access to healthy and affordable food for all residents, regardless of where you live, the type of transportation you have, your educational attainment, in order to achieve economic and societal equilibrium. I'll also present by how reducing health disparities through policy and programmatic changes can assist in ameliorating the disparity in certain health outcomes. So we know that the state of the evidence really shows us that we have higher rates of tobacco-associated, HPV-associated, lung, cervical, and colorectal cancers relative to urban populations. We know that there's higher rates of obesity in rural communities relative to those living in metro areas. And many of these disparities are related to modifiable behaviors at the individual level, such as tobacco, increasing fruit and vegetable, and less intake of sh uh, sugar-sweetened beverages. However, that really is focusing, as we've seen from our two previous speakers at the individual, rather also looking at as we saw in the first speaker, um, upward stream, such as access to healthcare services, access to food, healthy and affordable food, places to be physically active, and then policies geared towards how geographically isolated communities operate and some of their uh, systematic barriers. So we know that there's geographic isolation. Um, we have limited roads, limited transportation. There is no public busing. There is no private drivers no, such as Uber and Lyft. There is strong economic fallout, such as with manufacturing in certain parts of Pennsylvania, um, decrease in coal use, which from an environmental standpoint is wonderful, but we've seen lots of people lose their jobs because of the lack of coal. And we also know a lot of blue collar jobs have left for other parts of the world. There's also lower levels of educational attainment. Our educational system is not equipped to handle a variety of needs. And we've seen this in the growing gap in health inequality through our system. We also know there's less access to health care. Typically in rural communities, the nearest hospital is sometimes 45 minutes to an hour away. And then there's also less access to for affordable food. And, um, on average, the nearest supermarket or grocery store is 22 miles away. And I'll get into kind of those nuances and how that impacts individual behavior. And lastly, we know there's less access to everyday physical activity. There's less parks, there's less connected roads for walking or biking, and there's less trails to everyday destinations relative to urban and suburban locations. So what now to kind of drill down to really understand how neighborhood deprivation, access and food security, how are these all linked? How are they all together? Some important key points from my talk today is that neighborhood access to stores, what does that mean? That typically in our world means proximity to stores that, that may improve dietary intake and food personal. Purchases. So how we like to look at the neighborhood access, what that would mean is thinking about how we might have access in our neighborhood to gas stations or dollar stores versus um, grocery stores and larger supermarkets. And those type of stores will influence what we buy. Then when we talk about the consumer food environment, what we're meaning here is what's available inside the stores can vary drastically from one location to the next. 
Those stores with lower priced items and marketing of healthy items have higher sales data of those types of foods. So when we think of a very large Kroger or very large um, Walmart in a, in a higher income neighborhood, what's going to be available inside those stores and the price points inside those stores is going to vary drastically relative to a rural IGA type of store. And then we also know third is that the types of stores opening in rural communities, dollar stores are the number one retailer in 2019. And these type of stores target areas that are food deserts. And so if we go back to our two speakers about system level changes, this is a great opportunity where rural communities can look at zoning restrictions about what types of stores can open up. However, <laughs> Others point to that we need job growth and economic improvements where no realtors are willing to open up. So it's one thing to say, well, we don't want dollar stores to open up and the proliferation of dollar stores really um, is associated with higher obesity, higher intake of sugar sweetened beverages. However, if that's the only type of store that's willing to take that financial risk and open up in rural communities, it also can offer jobs and economic growth. And I don't have a solution but um, I think it's something that we in uh, prevention science need to think about. So how does this all connect to food security? One, we know that being close to healthy stores decreases your barrier to buy healthy food. We know that two, being able to shop inside stores where they have affordable prices and marketing improves those purchases. And three, rural communities often don't have number one and two. They aren't close. And when they do shop at a store, they do have higher prices and they do not have marketing promoting healthy foods. So what rural towns face is the proliferation of the dollar store and driving far to Walmart. So what are some causes of food insecurity? I'm just gonna highlight the top three. This is what has been cited in the top journals across um, our field in the United States. We know we have a high dependence on social grants. And so when that money leaves, then those community programs are left struggling. We know that there's a lack of uh, clean water in rural communities and, and also in urban, we can point clearly in Flint, Michigan, what took place. And we know in the community that I work in, there is no um, clean water. And so everyone has to buy bottled water. And the biggest reason that is cited is poverty and the lack of income. So although my focus is definitely on food security and on healthy eating, that ties back to poverty and the lack of income in these rural communities. So I'll be focusing just on my work that's funded through the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. It's called the High Obesity Program or HOP um, 1809. This second grant that, um, um, excuse me, this grant is in its second round. So on environmental and structural changes to improve health. So our main outcomes are primarily fruit and vegetable intake and daily physical activity. In this project, we're focusing on the following key areas. We wanna work with the faith-based community to improve environmental changes. We are working with grocery stores, convenience stores, and food pantries to improve product offerings and access. And we're trying to reach new and emerging farmers to increase farmer capacity. And we're also establishing a connectivity plan to build infrastructure to allow walking to everyday destinations. So this is overall what we've been doing in Martin County. We've spent $269 were spent by kids on fresh fruits and vegetables from local Kentucky farmers through a uh, um, nutrition education program called Pop Club. Three farmers participated and they sold about 664 pounds of produce. I'm going to talk a little bit more about Faithful Families, the partnerships that we've reached in the food pantries in Martin County. So our first program was with Faithful Families and this is a cooperative extension program that looks at PSE level changes within the faith communities. We know that Faithful, working with Faithful Communities empowers those communities and they can be our best health advocate for healthy spaces, particularly um, among communities who are affected by health disparities and lack of resources. So what we've done in Martin County is we partnered with two churches and both churches had about 21 people in each church that completed the nine week program. PSE changes took place to increase the healthfulness of food and beverages. So we, as we talked about water, so we provided water provided refrigeration for a beverage station and that they would have water to access at all times. So that is a, um, in a sense, an environmental change at the church level. So that refrigeration now, they will have that for years to come. We provided cutting boards for food preparation and then we also installed stoves so that people were able to prepare um, more meals at the congregation when they would do these different events 
rather than buying store-bought processed foods. The next aspect of this um, community level change was really has been working with grocery stores and convenience stores. There are two rural grocery stores that are IGAs and five gas stations that have agreed to partner with us to help improve the consumer food environment. So what's inside? So if you remember, we're not opening up a new grocery store, although that would be a great avenue. We This grant doesn't allow for opening a new grocery store. However, it does allow for the consumer food environment. So what's inside the store? So strategies that we've used before in Kentucky and in Eastern rural Appalachia, Kentucky, have been the following. Product placement of healthier items, marketing of those healthier items, price promotions, meaning we offer double coupons or sometimes we'll, we'll offer um, kind of like that double bucks program where if you buy one set of fruit, one pound of fruit, you get another pound for free. And then we also have offered recipe samples. So if you'll see the marketing we used was the Smart Snack logo and it, that um, was developed with all the coalition members that we're working with in Martin County. It says nourish your body, fuel your life. And we put these next, or we put these next to healthy items inside the grocery store and inside the gas station. But meanwhile, we also then at the same time offered price promotions on those items. We then also put plated up. And in Kentucky, um, people are very proud of their state. There's a lot of state pride. And so we focus partnering with farmers about local ingredients and then developing recipes that highlight um, the local products. So for example, um, blackberries are our state fruit. And so it's highly affordable. It's accessible across the state for the most part. And so we will develop like a raspberry salsa with blackberries in it. And then we market that recipe and along with that product. So we have collected receipt and sales data, which we're gonna to collect to examine how that purchase and behavior throughout the proje project influences sales. And so typically what we're hoping to find is that the increase in sales of those items would then encourage the grocery store managers um, to stock more of that item at lower prices. So we now have also partnered with food pantries. And so I think this is a great example of, this is the food pantry where um, people actually will go in. So if you see those shelves, that's where food will be stocked. Right now, it's it was stocked with, um, you know, materials that they needed. However, that's the type of environment that people are shopping in. So if we come back to the consumer food environment, the food pantries are a main source of where our families and adolescents and children get their food. And think about walking into that food pantry, and that's what it looks like. So I think um, pictures can can convey a lot, and how working with food pantries to improve the environment within and also the products within can really help improve the food security among the residents. So we've provided funds to build capacity to increase refrigeration and we've seen an increase in the product offering from baseline to end of year one. As you can see in that picture, we were then able to provide yogurt and milk and cheese and we'll be able to provide um, some other refrigerated items that has never been able to be provided before. Two food pantries right now are serving around 200 families per month. And the end of our year two, we're expanding out to reach more food pantries and support development of new pantries. And so what we're really hoping to do here is expand what's inside the pantries, but then also um, have greater reach among the other pantries that are bordering between Kentucky and West Virginia, where we see a huge increase in food insecurity rates. We also are gonna be working with um, farmers. So there's an overall lack of farmers in Martin County. And I'm gonna footnote really here for a moment. A lot of people think in rural communities, oh, there's tons of land and there's tons of farmers. And that actually is the opposite. What we see is there's a huge decrease in the amount of people that want to become farmers. And so we have elderly farmers who cannot maintain the land that they're used to. And also then who, um, basically leave the land for larger companies to buy out. And so in Martin County, there used to, at one point there was 32 farmers and now we're down to three. And so, but there is a growth in small family gardens. So what we're trying to do there is we've partnered with Grow Appalachia to increase the amount of food grown and increase the number of families that are engaging in family gardening. So here's a quote from one of our focus groups. My sister lives by herself. I live by myself. I can't pl plow the garden. They plowed it for us, meaning Grow Appalachia. They helped us with our gardens and we ate really healthy while we had garden food. So we anticipate in this coming year to expand our product offerings um, from these small family gardens to put them in backpack programs for children in the schools 
So any extra produce they grow, we're going to be able to provide that in a backpack program and other ways to improve food access. So again, although this is a little bit at the individual level, what we're trying to say is from a system approach, we need to help grow more food. <laughs> and that really is from a system higher up on the system chain. And that's what we're trying to target. Uh, lastly, one of our main things is the connectivity plan. And so we conducted the ACT plan with key stakeholders in Martin County. And we found that there's an overall large um, need connectivity plan needed to be related needed to be developed related to walking and daily transportation. And so again, from our focus groups, we see down below, we have no place to walk. I mean, we have to drive a while to get to something to a walking trail. So if those of you who are in urban areas, you won't know what a holler is, but a holler is almost like you're walking on the street and there's two big um, mountains almost on either side of you and the sun really can't get in. And so it's not a great um, area, to, area to walk in because there's no sun and it's not very pleasant. So you've got hollers everywhere that people can't, they have no way to get here. And so it's very hard to create these walking trails. So um, those are kind of some of the things we're working on and what we found from our baseline characteristics, I'm just gonna highlight some key moment, key um, attributes here. We know that 43% have less than a high school education and 36% of our population has um, a high school graduate degree or uh, GED. So um, close to 80% <laughs> are high school or less. And also we see that in our SNAP participation, we know that 40% are participating in SNAP, while 60% are not. And the 60% are not, that doesn't mean that they're not eligible. It just means that they have not gone through the paperwork. So what do we see in differences in shopping practices and food security status? So we stratified based on SNAP participants. And the reason we stratified, my work to date has shown that a lot of those that participate in SNAP or Supplemental Nutrition Education Program as well, they um, are slightly different than those who are eligible for SNAP but not participate. And I'm not gonna go into that for this talk, but we know that if we can reach some of those participants that are eligible for SNAP but not participating, we may see an a decrease in food insecurity. So some of these, um, there's not a lot of differences. If you'll see, where do you get your groceries? Most people go to a grocery store, which would be like the IGA or a Food City or a Kroger, um, but close to 20%, um, sorry, close to 20% um, shop at a um, super center. And what's the biggest reason? Price followed by location. So again, we really need to focus on how pricing structures matter and then location of those stores matter. And we know again, among, about, uh, among SNAP though, more people are actually aware of the farmers, I'm sorry, non-SNAP people, excuse me, are more aware of the farmer's market than SNAP. And so we need to really, again, work with our farmers and farmer's market to increase um, EBT acceptance and SNAP marketing. Pardon the interruption. Uh, we appear to have lost the connection for Allison. Uh, I'm going to bring you back on screen, Tanya, and yes. uh, perhaps we can move on to the Q&A session. Yes. Um, so uh, thank you to Allison. Unfortunately, we lost the connection and also to Kelly um, as well as Deborah. So we have a couple of questions. So I'm going to start with um, one question for uh, Deborah. Um, the question is, what ideas, uh, what ideas do you have for how we can account for the historic factors that have led to inequity. And you have to unmute. Oh, I was being totally brilliant too while on mute. <laughs> um, and so I think it's at this stage, it's sort of an acknowledgement because we know that these systems and these structures and the disparities that we see didn't just come from nowhere. Right. So I think what we're starting to see now more than ever is just an acknowledgement that there are these long standing standing chronic inequities in our system that have now given rise to what we see by way of the disparities that many of us study. And so I think it's a couple of things that we can do. It's important to uh, both document them. You know, there are legacy effects and long enduring effects from things like and I have a 
an ongoing study now that's led by a colleague at Michigan State, Dr. Rick Sadler, looking at the legacy effects of discriminatory housing policies. And it's interesting because when you look at the impact of redlining, people talk about it as if it was a thing of the past. But if you actually look, redline communities today are less green. Redline communities today have lower rates of home ownership. Low, redline communities have you know, worse health outcomes. So that historic divestment has shown up now in the modern landscape. So I think we can one, both document it, and then two, integrate that into our work. Because if we could undo policies like that, and if we can almost reverse engineer them, so the same way redlining as an example was a divestment in communities, we have good data that indicate that reinvestment in communities will turn those things around. So I, I agree with the sort of what's underneath of the question, which is there's a history here. We should be documenting it and then learning from that history and figuring out how we can sort of put things in place that undo some of those things. Thank you. Um, there's another question for you as well. So um, they want to know uh, what are the preventive resources uh, to address overdose, drug overdose? Okay, great. And so there's a couple things that we did. Um, and I'll talk specifically about work that's happening um, in Michigan, because there's this interesting question in my mind about what's the right level to be operating at. You know, I, I always tell people what's happening in City Hall is probably more important than what's happening in the State House and probably more impactful in your day to day life than what's happening in the White House. So we've got some local work, some state level work, and then there's some federal level work. What we've been working on in Michigan, and, and there are multiple sort of organizations coming to this from different ways. The first thing is we started to look at equity and resource allocation. So uh, Michigan Medicaid has a program now, and they have two substance abuse indicators that they're tracking, and they have linked payments to disparities. And not disparities right now in the outcome, but disparities in who gets what. So as an example, they will tolerate no more than a 5% difference in rates of medication-assisted treatment being started in the EB. So if you have you know, a, a community population that's 50-50, but 75% of whites who come into the ED are started on medication assisted treatment, but only 20% African Americans, you have to be able to account for and explain that disparity. And it has now been linked to incentive payments for providers, for Medicaid providers. So those are the kinds of policies that we can implement. And one other example, there's a whole lot that we've done, but one other thing that I wanna to point to specifically that's relevant for prevention is that we know that prevention works as well as treatment and bringing those things together for families that are grappling with addiction, I think is so critical. So we have a program that we launched in Flint through my center, the Flint Center for Health Equity Solutions called the Strength in Flint Families Program. And what we have done is we've now gotten the sort of groundwork made and had the evidence-based strength in, strength in families program. So the program that Carol Comfer and others developed in partnership with NIDA to have that program be a, also a Medicaid billable program and to have it be widespread available in all of our health regions, all, all throughout the state, but we're broken up into these um, particular health regions. So we've got things that deal with the continu continuum from prevention and you know identifying families and youth at high risk, all the way down to naloxone distribution that is equitable and policies that incentivize and and disincentivize providers for inequitable practices. Thank you so much. And one last question for Kelly. Um, so there's a question related to uh, maternal and child health. Um, do you know what maternal behaviors account for improvement in birth outcomes due to EITC? And could it simply be less stress? Yeah, so this is a great question. And we and also others have looked uh, have started to look at some of these um, potential mechanisms. And so there is there is some evidence that um, access to prenatal care increases with the more generous EITC um, and also smoking decreases um, so th that there's some evidence for those two. Stress is critically important, but we don't have measures of it. So 
you know, we have to think about what type of multi-level studies could we do? Because we were relying on the outcome data set was the birth certificate data, which others have also used. So thinking through what data sets are available or how could we do a multi-level um, analysis and, and try to capture some of that information, really important point. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, uh, so, Allison, you're back with us. Fantastic. Yeah, sorry um, about that. Yeah, that's okay. Um, so, we're at the end of our session. Did Allison, did you have any closing remarks? No, the only closing thing I just wanted to say, thank you, everyone. And the other thing is we've really seen an impact on food insecurity with COVID-19. So, um, I think we all should need to be putting that variable in our models mm -hmm. as we move forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure um, working with you three, and um, we're, this session is, has ended. So um, goodbye, everyone, and um, enjoy the rest of the SPR conference. <laughs>